a disclaimer. Um, well, uh, I I was a home care physician for the larger part of the twenty years, but. Gradually, I developed more and more into like planning for community services um, and a bit of research here and there, um, advocacy training and so on. And now, I am uh, practicing mostly as a consultant, uh, supporting uh, some community aged care organizations, home care services. Um, and uh, so, I must say that I can only discuss this from my position, supporting a few services, while I don't personally deliver the care myself, I would be able to do this proudly if you asked me a few years ago. But now, um, when I uh, work with some community service providers, I'm only full of humility and awe with what they had to go through working with seniors in the community. So I do have a handful of uh, patients that I see as a private home care physician. And my experience is without nurses and um, social workers, care coordinators, my hands are really, really tied as a doctor, you know, taking, taking care of people with dementia and palliative care, and they ask me to, for help. But I find that as a doctor, actually, I'm quite useless. <laughs> but of course, uh, no, I mean, there's still a lot of uh, work involved. The second thing I'd like to say is um, uh, because of the last few years been working with uh, regional developmental organizations and uh, supporting the development in um, some Asia Pacific countries, I am so proud to be living in Singapore and thanks to the work of MOH, uh, AIC, we have come a long way in improving the care for our seniors who are disabled. So it's um, I can't really be fault-finding, but um, I'm just coming from perspective of, say, a, a Singapore citizen trying to just raise the challenges and see how can we sort of work on it and improve it. And thirdly, I'd like to congratulate Jack for that very visionary lecture. I was um, listening and reading the slides. Um, I was just keep wanting to say like, like, and like. <laughs> and if it's on the social media, I'll share it. Okay, so anyway, um, I got many, many slides and my time is very limited, so forgive me, I'm going to rush through my sharing. So the first half of my talk, I'll cover about the goals of home care, and the second part, I'd like to address the challenges and what I see are opportunities for us now. And because this is um, uh, related to ethical practices, right, practicing in a way that is... Uh, right by the client. Um, I, will, um, I will speak from, um, uh, I mean, multi-dimensional ways, not just literature review and so on, but it's also, um, I try to be maybe anecdotal and personal about this. So forgive me if I sound really, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, uh, yeah, anecdotal, okay. <laughs> So anyway, I'd like to talk about what home care means to me. When I first started, uh, you know, when you run a home care organization, you need to be very careful with eligibility criteria. So you need to be really, really homebound before home care services, which is expensive, can come to your place. But as our environment and our infrastructure start to develop, I start to see the blurring of the lines between what is home care and what is not home care. So for today, I would like to talk about home care, really for people who like to age in place even as they become more and more disabled. And by disabled, I mean IADL, because if you're not able to perform IDL, you can't live alone at home perpetually. You need somebody to check on you. So I would like to restrict, I would like to scope the talk about home care as anybody who is at least who is not independent in at least one of the IADLs, and that in the clinical frailty scales for the clinicians here are those who be around five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So it ranges from those who are just a little bit like not doing very well. We, we see a lot. I worked recently with, um, 
with the grassroots organization trying to identify seniors who are at risk. And they were telling me that when they go around with the MPs visiting door to door, there are so many singles who are at home and their houses are so unkempt. And you can see that there's a certain risk in the idea already. And home care, I would say, also refer to supporting people like them. And when you um, think about long-term care, long-term care cannot be restricted to people living in a nursing home. Long-term care would be meant for people like them. You know, How do we take care of fellow Singaporeans who are in need of support? So home care, to me, is long-term care while living in the community. So what would be the goals for home care? So Jack has given a very good um, outline uh, from uh, um, ethicists, philosophers, uh, philosophers and, and, and thinkers in this light. I'm just sharing with you uh, from as a doctor. Okay, so um, perhaps you could indulge me for a moment. Uh, you may like to close your eyes. <laughs> you see, we are talking about existential issues, so you better feel it, okay? So maybe you can close your eyes. Anyway, there's too much words to read. You wouldn't want to read. You can close your eyes and rest. So imagine you're 85 years old. You could be a man or a woman. Your spouse has just passed away a few years ago. Your only son is busy with his own life of work, of caring for his own kids, of saving for his own retirement, and of um, balancing his own life, self-care. And because of ill health and frailty, you have difficulty managing activities essential for personal well-being and safety. Every morning, you have to take eight or ten pills. You're not very sure. Medicines for diabetes, heart disease, cholesterol, bone health, constipation, and high blood pressure. You are homebound now because you can't walk very well because of your knee pain. You have many hospital appointments you have lost track of. Sometimes you wonder, why am I taking care of my health at all? Your son has to take leave to take you to these appointments. So I have a few questions for yourself. At that stage of your life, what would be your biggest concern? Would you like to move into an assisted living facility? Before you say yes, recently I went to Bangkok. Even in Bangkok, it's 8,000 Singapore dollars a month. Well, how would you like the doctors to help you? Okay, you can open your eyes. <laughs> so that is um, what we're trying to do. Huh? Um, you know, that uh, goals of home care, so you are a little bit disabled, and what would be your biggest concern? So I'd like to share a few stories over the um, many years. I can't even remember their names now, but I remember the stories. The stories range from like 2003, I think immediately after COVID, sorry, not COVID, that was SARS, all the way to just recently. So this gentleman, um, I remember him because um, he was very personal, but like a good friend, you know, he liked to chat with me, bring me, bring me down to coffee shop and buy me coffee. He's, he's very frail, he needs walking uh, a quad stick to walk, but he was living in Chinatown Plaza, so um, there was no leaf landing, he had a hard time climbing stairs, but he wanted to treat me to a coffee. So his story was, he was admitted to hospital for, um, for TB, and because he was a, a single uh, singleton, um, living in rental flat, they treated him for TB as an inpatient. He was very frail because of TB. And then they discovered colorectal cancer, had a surgery, so he had a long hospitalization period. Came home deconditioned um, and had got breathlessness. So uh, home care was referred. So what impressed me was one of the visits that I visited him, I felt a liver mass. So the first thing that came to my mind was it was a metastasis from the colorectal cancer to the liver. He needs to be investigated and treated. But he told me he will never go back to the hospital because when he was in the hospital on the bed, he wanted the nurse to help him to pass urine and they just told him to wait until he peed himself onto the bed. And uh, it was really 
unhappy and for, uh, he was really un unhappy. And then also when I started to interact with him more, I realized that there's so many men in the neighborhood, you know, who, who's, who's like very really burly and looks like Paikia type, coming to his house and help him and he ordered them around. So I think he must be a leader. So he, <laughs> saying hospital was unacceptable to him. And uh, even, I remember I offered to drive him to the hospital, but I couldn't. And also, now to think about it, it's not fair for a doctor to drive him to the hospital. It's just not sustainable, okay? <laughs> This is another case, more recent, I think it's about 2014 when we started the dementia care system. Um, this is a gentleman, his house is like that. Very, very messy. There was a slow uh, rice cooker cooking everything. You know, he just put everything there and cook. He was referred to us from a community um, social agency for trying to do something, maybe to send him to a nursing home. But when I assessed him, his MMSC score was not too bad. It's 20 upon 30. That's like mild dementia. But when we talk to him, he may not really have dementia. I'm wondering whether is it, um, it could be FTD, frontal temporal, but it could also be some kind of developmental disorders. So um, he was moving around. He could actually take public transport to go to JB. And so I felt that he's not really that dependent. He may have an undiagnosed um, ID or developmental disorders. He took care of his father until the father passed away and he's in this state. He's very cheerful, very happy. And we, me and my colleague discussed and we felt that uh, we shouldn't ship him into a nursing home, you know, just because his house is like that. <laughs> Sorry, my, my <laughs> yeah, so these are, um, yeah, the cases. Then the next case was a more recent one. During 2021, the COVID pandemic, I think there was, Singapore was still quite tight at that time because this lady, um, bed bound and chair bound, uh, chair bound uh, has dementia, um, had a fever and the family did ART and was positive. And uh, the next the protocol by right, you should have a PCR in a GP clinic, but the son said that they the grandson said they cannot bring grandma to the GP because she will never agree to wearing a mask. And at that time, Singapore was really tense. So they asked me, I was on call, so I listened. And then I was also, I, I'm not sure whether I can handle COVID at home. It's got high fever, very frail. According to our protocol, patients like that need to be hospitalized. Her preferred plan of care was not to go hospital ever. And then I consulted a palliative physician that I know and he said that there's currently no capability for palliative care in the community for, for COVID. And so I have to convince the family to send her to the hospital. And she died later in the hospital. And the family was, um, of course, understandably aggrieved. And uh, the last examples are two cases that I saw more recently. It was a case that I, uh, in, a, in a private nursing home that... Uh, he, he used to be living in Topayu in the rental flat, and the main issue that they told me was that uh, he's always screaming and shouting, wanting to go home, even after you explain to him that the house has been returned to HDB, um, he will not budge unless... So what we did was we engaged him with some kind of activities like uh, Jaga, you know, some other people, then he could quiet down. Another case was, um, but, uh, but when I talked to him, he still wanted to go back home. The other one was in a nursing home in the north. Um, it looks a little bit dated if you visit it in terms of his decor, but I worked there as a doctor, and the, 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 there's so much joy, you know. The nurses from the Philippines are so full of joy, and the seniors and the nurses are so happy together, and those ones... I mean, just last week, I was doing routine assessment for an old, old lady. The first thing I asked her is, are you happy here? She's got dementia. She couldn't understand a lot of things. But when I asked her about whether she's happy here, she said she is. So I told the nurses, and they were so happy about it. So, um, yeah, so I felt that uh, this example gave me some thinking that uh, homelessness or being at home is really a state of mind. It's not whether you're physically staying at home or in a nursing home. So, um, well, it's obvious that everyone prefers to live at home. I think some of you may want to live in a assisted living facilities, hoping that somebody will design and build up quickly. But, but I recently, in the last few years, I was trying to develop this retirement community, and we have a plot of land dedicated to us, wanted to build. But when I, when they, when when it really comes down to moving into it, 
nobody wants to move unless they're really disabled, <laughs> you know. So anyway, uh, HDB did a survey just uh, recently um, in 2018 and found that majority of people living in HDB still prefer to live in their own flat, even if they develop disability. And of course, famously, the survey by uh, frequently cited by the media from Liam Foundation, that 76% per of people prefer to die at home even if there isn't enough support for them. So there's a need for home, living at home even as a person becomes frail. And what do people want from their primary care providers? So this was an older study in NHS and they interviewed like um, people visiting GPs um, a questionnaire and found that while GP as a doctor, we think that people just want prescriptions. But when they interviewed the, the people as, um, attending um, the clinics, people, majority, 88 to 99%, preference is communication from the doctor, partnership and health promotion. Next come physical examination, and prescription is only one quarter of the time of the expectations. And this was found that as a person become more vulnerable, this is... They, they, they need this more than ever from their primary care doctor. And this is another um, uh, piece of evidence um, that I'd like to just share. Um, I understand, um, I, I was very impressed by the philosophy around healthy aging because um, we know that uh, health previously defined as the absence of diseases is not tenable in an aging population. And uh, it's indeed due to the diversity of how people age and also the, the importance of social determinants that WHO have this new framework. And I realized it was based on Nancy Jacker's work on the capabilities, this um, dignity-based um, uh, model. So, and, and, if you under, and if you look at it carefully, as a person grows older and older, they lose their functional capacity and the thrust of the healthcare system is to do our best to prevent this. Not just the physical decline, but prevent them from losing their ability to do things that are meaningful. So you can see that there's a lot to be done in our environment. So this caring for home, the, the, the goals of home care is not merely the responsibilities of the doctors or the nurses or the RHS or even Ministry of Health. It is everybody's business. At the bottom, you can see the environment needs to promote it such that people as they age through the trajectory of aging can remain, even if they're big bound, they're still able to learn and have a hope for waking up the next day to look forward to something. And for long-term care, which starts at the, you know, the middle row, you know, at the person who become frail, while we, we need to be focused on the dignity of the persons and we need to have... <laughs> I now understand Jack, she had, cannot read her own slide. Me too, I can't read my own slide. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then, so anyway, the, so the services, you still have to continue with health promotion, disease prevention. And I would argue that actually, frail care in the community, long-term care is health promotion and disease prevention. And if health promotion and disease prevention, consumer model doesn't work, people don't pay for it, then somebody needs to pay for it, right? So based on all these, um, my reflections about the goals of home care, safety and hygiene is a matter of opinion. A frail person risks being denied having a voice. Institutionalization threatens our sense of identity and dignity. Most Singaporeans prefer to live at home until the last days of their lives. Home is a feeling. Feeling is most important when cognition fails, especially when you develop dementia. Most people prefer to live, age and die at home, but this was hard during the COVID pandemic. The vulnerable person values person-centered approach to care. Person-centered care is built on trusting relationship and skillful communication. Care for the older person is biopsychosocial in nature. And long-term care is really health promotion and disease prevention. So to, to echo Jack's earlier presentation, goals of home care, supporting agency and preventing harm. So from a practitioner, translating into principle of practice is really about person-centered care. This is now enshrined in the guidelines for home care and community care, and I'm very happy about it. Supporting and 
and tra- sustaining care relationships, clarifying the duties of caregivers, I lump it together as the prioritization of caregiver support. So are our services prioritizing caregiver support? And do we have health and social integration? Uh, recently, I understand we, we had this um, social prescribing conference, and I think this is wonderful work. Especially from a healthcare perspective, we need to broaden our scope to include the social dimensions of care. Reframing relationships at home as a person age, I see it all the time talking to seniors about, um, doctor, can you give me something so that I can die? Or that, uh, no old, no use. Huh? It's about focus on mental well being across the life course. And lastly, fostering trust in the systems, I will argue that it has to be de specialized, decentralized, perhaps even demedicalized, patient centered medical home where the GPs need to rise up to the challenge of care for the frail. So this is the first part of my talk. I'll just use 10 minutes to talk about the remainder, my um, perception of the challenges and the current opportunities. Um, so uh, I, I can't release, well, I consult for a few of them, but I can't really speak for anyone. So I'm just going to speak from my own uh, um, angle of uh, perspective. So I see one of the biggest challenge is really the demand and the resources. So it's very well known that uh, by 2030, one in four of us will be above the age of 65. And among them, there'll be 83,000 seniors living alone and 100,000 seniors with at least small disability. So they would need caregiving, be it just somebody buying food or cleaning the house or even changing diapers, regular two-hourly turning, feeding through the rouse tube, managing um, uh, wounds and uh, um, um, giving uh, morphine. You know? So there will be hundreds thousands of them. Imagine each of them has a foreign domestic worker. You know? so, and then what more you know, caregiving to support? So there will be a greater number of older persons who will require care in the community, especially at home. And while our healthy life expectancy has increased over the years, you look at this data, the one on the left is a, is a, a captured um, a picture from the latest 2023 uh, blueprint for successful aging. But if you look at the trend, from 1990 to 2017, it grows in parallel. The healthy life expectancy and the life expectancy grow in parallel. So you can grow, it's like a, it's like never reaching the holy grail of healthy aging, you know. So the longer you live, the longer you remain disabled. I mean, you remain disabled for the same amount of time, about 10 years. And then there's these changing family structures. Um, I can't read this, but I'm sure you know what I'm trying to say. The percentage of people living alone or living with their spouse only has increased dramatically from 12% to 20, for, from from the, the absolute difference is not a lot, but the, but the relative difference has increased by one-fifth one to one-quarter of people living alone or living with only an elderly spouse. So who is going to look after them? Okay, so this is actually the biggest challenge I feel. It's the scale of the issue. I mean, we really need to increase our capacity intelligently with uh, technology, whatever you have, we have to put it in. And of course, the workforce. So next, I'd like to talk about the operations because operations directly impact on the experience of care by, um, by people receiving home care. First of all, it's very well, I mean, felt, you know, all of us in the healthcare sector, all, there was a very bad nursing crunch and I've got a friend, you know, in, in our social media chat group, a specialist in, in private hospitals, saying that some of the wards have to be closed because there aren't enough nurses. So we do have a manpower crunch issue. And when you want to, you know, we talk about delivering on goals of um, home care and you need to have certain practice, right, practice principles. So one of them is about health and social integration. Health and social integration is, is really great to have, but it's really not easy to do. It's about meeting regularly. It's about the doctors knowing how to work as a team with social workers, with therapists, with nurses, 
and not be the one always like uh, in an interdisciplinary team meeting, everybody just consult me, I'm the grand round. It's, it, it, it's, it cannot be practiced this way. Everybody needs to come to the table and putting their degree at the door. Just think for the person's care. So how many of us are practicing this way? And do we pay for people to meet? Or is it just um, uh, a care manager writing a memo to the doctors? And do the doctors reply? I mean, I can't, I, I can't say that people don't because I can see very variegated practices, but I can see lots of barriers here. Um, so there are, of course, adequacy in health and care integration. Firstly, manpower resources and competency. Do people, are people trained in working as a team? Do, do people think out of their training like, say, a counsellor or a social worker or a nurse? And accessibility integration, Singapore's system has become quite complex. I mean, I'm working in the community for the last 20 plus years and I can really see the shift. If I, um, yeah, if I go for holiday for a few weeks and come back, I'll be a bit lost actually. So, the and the and the electronic medical record system and then the the password, you know, because of the tightness of the control, sometimes it keep changing if you don't use it. So it's quite complicated to do. And uh, so the centralized referral system is, of course, it's very good, but it's it's not wieldy. It's very difficult when I try to refer my patient. I, I used to have a password, but it doesn't work anymore. So I need to call them up and then I have to write. And then when I write, it's a thick pile of it. And then I send over and my friend who is, in, who is at the referring source, because we know each other, will tell me, Wai Chong, when you write, uh, I need to type, you know. Oh, okay. So, you know, it's, <laughs> it's not very convenient. Quality management, quality monitoring requires some transparency, some consistency of data. We haven't quite got it yet, our standardization of assessment. Even our assessment is, is quite medical focused. There's lack of psychosocial assessment. If you, you can ask around, very few people do social assessment or assessment about what is meaningful to you. You know, this kind of assessment is, is really important. And, um, and do, do practitioners involve the seniors and the caregivers in care planning? Mental well-being of care staff as well as the informal caregivers is huge. Sustainability is not just about money. It's also about whether can our staff take it or not. The turnover, we all can see. The turnover is very high in the last few years. And managing stress and pre pre preventing burnout, I think this is a national agenda now. So these are the challenges in operations. And well, in home care, um, medical care play a big role. It's not that doctors are useless. So doctors are the underwriter of risk. If I say this person don't need to go to a &E, the nurses and the social workers and the care managers will say, well, the doctors say don't have to go to the hospital. Doctors play a big role. If the doctor feels burnt out and overwhelmed, we'll send everyone to the hospital. So, so PCC is relationship-based, okay? So, and uh, 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 this was a recent study by SMU. Only 35% of seniors have a regular family physician. And when struck with the catastrophic conditions, I mean, I see this a lot. I don't have evidence, so it's all my opinion. They go to hospital, and then they are referred to many specialists, and then to many services. And they no longer turn up at the GPs. And GPs don't really have the capacity to call them up. How can you never come and see me? It's just, you know, just, just as well. You follow up because it's a bit complicated. You go with the hospital transitional care, and the hospital transitional care come and see you. Then have to transit to somebody else. And the experience is... It is like that, okay? Keep transiting from one care to another. The, the clients, seniors and the caregivers do not, perhaps do not know any better. So, and also many primary care providers do not have psychosocial care capacity. I mean, of course they don't have and um, can't blame them, but it's really important, don't you think? So challenges to caregiver support. Caregivers have many unmet needs and recently there was a study done by um, uh, NCSS, I think Prof Meta was involved in it. More than half of caregivers feel burdened or are barely coping. And most healthcare services focus only on the care recipients. If there should be any assessment for caregivers, it's a token Zeri burden inventory, just whether you're stressed or not. And if they're stressed, then they'll just, you know, counselling. It's not like that. You need to do an assessment, complete assessment of a caregiver needs. 
So, um, yeah, so we need a caregiver needs assessment tool. Okay, my time is running out, and, uh, but I think many of these, many of you here would understand. End of life care at home, we know that with population aging, the crude birth rate will definitely rise, even if the age corrected birth rate falls. So, there will be more and more death that we will have to encounter. And we, and, and, um, well, this is from um, a, a, a paper from California when they develop a different model of palliative care. That, that, but I find that the critique of the system is, is still relevant in Singapore. That palliative care is viewed as a terminal event rather than a longitudinal process. Like, there's a point when you refer to hospice and, and then the, the long-term care provider, the primary care, no longer f is involved in the care. So, but that is... I mean, the patients may not know better, but to me, I feel it is a bit unfortunate. The precious relationship has to be discontinued as a result. Number two, palliative care is defined within a false dichotomy between symptomatic treatment and disease-focused treatment. Well, I think maybe this is more relevant in America because of the tightness of the funding. Decision to focus care as palliative is not negotiated among patients, family members, and providers. Patient autonomy in making treatment choices is accorded undue prominence. It's, and then palliative care is a parallel system rather than an integrated primary care process. So some of these fundamental flaws I feel is still quite relevant in Singapore. And there was a paper by IPS, um, um, Christopher Gee, uh, that uh, most people prefer to die at home, but very few do. Okay, and this I like to give some air time to. Aging needs of the minority. I mean, previously, when everybody aged, we only look at the national data. We never differentiate between men and women. But now, in the last 10 years, thanks to AWARE and South Foundation, you know, so there's more awareness that gender actually play a role in the experience of aging. But nobody is doing statistics on the other minority. People of gen different genders, identities, cultural and social economic backgrounds, sexual orientations, those with non-traditional families, no siblings, no children, people with disabilities and long-term illness such as HIV and TB, people with challenging life situations such as those who, um, who are incarcerated, you know, ex-convicts, um, substance abuse, mental illness, how do they age, right? Recently, a friend of mine has started a service for people with intellectual disability, adult. This was a big gap. And then there are, there are even older caregivers that was a wonderful uh, service and like highlight the needs of the minority that pre frequently when you look at national data, we don't see them, right? So um, the opportunities and challenges, I think everybody knows we are doing, I feel we are doing very well as a, as a society. This 2023 action plan for successful aging is, um, is really great. <laughs> And uh, so I don't have time, but I think you know what I mean. We have a lot. We are going to increase more AAC, more dementia care, more caregiver support, more ACP, more accessible end of life care, and we are going to have a national frailty strategy, and healthy SG where where people are enrolled into primary care is something that I've been dreaming for, and I think this is great. It's just that. Would they have psychosocial integration? You know, can they work closely with the AAC? Would they work well? Do they have a way to work together? Or is it just health SG, GPs integrating vertically with RHS to serve you know, the financing of healthcare or, and, and uh, over horizontal integration with psychosocial dimensions of care? Then, uh, and, and for the last 20 over years, I've been like, actually not 20 years, it's 18 years, when saying that you, before quality, you need standardization of data and clarity of your monitoring. And you need an assessment that is biopsychosocial and person-centric. So there is um, plans to, to, to implement uh, standardized assessments such as Interri across all the long-term care facilities. So my final slide is a vision for the future of aged care services. Age and dementia inclusive neighbours and neighbourhoods. Hub services, age-friendly primary healthcare centres supported online by specialists, 
multidisciplinary care teams with standardized online and offline care screening and assessment capability, each care manpower to support the residents, exercise, social and tech prescribing cap capacity, health and safety monitoring of the residents, emergency response on and offline, facial recognition for identification and financing, void decks with modular compartments for group activities, small group homes within public housing with assisted living facilities and skilled nursing and end-of-life care capability, IoT sensors and train active agers as paid caregivers. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you.